nice to meet you, Sam. Nice to meet you, Amy. I mean, this is just, I guess it's the first time I've sat down and talked like this to a rock musician, composer. I've had a few conversations with others along the way, but I'm really looking forward to this. Yes. So uh, maybe just a couple things. We were just chatting before the camera turned on, but I'll just give a quick little introduction. Yeah, welcome to the United States. Welcome to Tennessee. <laughs> Thank this is, you. This is my adopted home state. Um, I've basically grown up here, although my family's yeah. not from here. It, they were from the West Coast, but anyway. Sure. Um, just a quick thing for the audience, let me tell you that this this program is sponsored by SanDisk. Yeah, there's the camera I'm supposed to look at, um, which is the company who backs up our computers and gives us SSDs. So, uh, thanks to them. An introduction to myself. I'm a classical musician. Um, I grew up in a classically centered household. I won't give you the whole background right now because it's quite a story, mm -hmm. but I am a pianist, uh, I'm a harpist, harpist is my first love, my primary instrument, I have a master's in harp performance, um, I'm a music teacher, I have a full and active music studio where I teach both those instruments and music theory and are also all, all the, it's kind mm -hmm. of a little preparatory type program. and. Um, I saw that you you teach music theory as well. Oh, indeed, I do. Yeah, I, my my background is very different though. I, I sort of came up in a uh, a household of music, but all all rock music and all different kinds so of, of that. And <laughs> came to schooling a little bit later, so I, you know I was very much self-taught. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, this this idea of a rock musician teaching music theory <laughs> in the educational system is just mm. fascinating to me, and I I want to get to that, but. Um, I never touched, I never touched modern popular music styles, meaning I never listened mm -hmm. to them before about a year and a half ago. Amazing. After I married Vlad, um, he grew up with rock music and he has his favorite bands and favorite artists and favorite albums and, and, uh, he is a passionate music lover, not just rock, but classical also, which is how we built our communication early on. But he came with this idea of me sitting down to listen to rock music for the first time and I started that project a year and a half ago and to date I have listened somewhere between 60 and 70 bands by now. Wow. Most of them just one, sometimes two pieces. I have hundreds and thousands more to go but <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the things that my audience knows is that I have gone through so many so quickly that the names sometimes escape me because mm. it's a lot of information to retain for somebody who didn't know who Freddie Mercury was. Of course, was. decades gotta learn, of Gotta learn all the names and... of the bands, the artists, the... Anyway, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's who I am. Sure. And now here I am sitting down with you. This is a, an interview, but I'm not a journalist. I'm a musician. And I, I envision this just being a conversation. Sure. two musicians and see where it goes. So you're with Caligula's Horus and I have, I have listened to two Caligula's Horus pieces by awesome. now. About a year ago I listened to Graves. Ah, that was my introduction to the band. It's an interesting introduction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I this song at the time. <laughs> right? And then just recently I listened to Storm Chaser, just cool. a few weeks back. Of course. And so I had a couple questions about that. Yes. Piece. So, I understand, I did a bit of reading, it's about, it was inspired by the way people behave during the pandemic, a lot of people behave, right? At least that's what I read. Yeah, this, this is fantastic, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, of course, when you're sitting down to write a song, you have a blank slate. Mm. You can bring anything to the table and go anywhere. How did you settle, because I understand you're the composer, mm. so how did you settle on that that musical expression, that artistic um, shape, mm. to express what you wanted to through the music. It's a, it's a it's a really tricky question because I like I, I I rationalize a lot of what I do. Like I'm I'm the kind of person who does tend to analyze as I go and you know see if I can pick the best 
directions at any uh -huh. given point. But the thing that I find it hardest to, to, to really understand is where formative ideas come from. You know, like where does that first little right, motif right. or something yeah. appear from that I can then build around? And in the case of the Storm Chaser, I, I think it, it came out of a similar, um, well, a, a similar period of writing that some of the other mm -hmm. songs did, okay. which were all equally inspired by this just, you know, bleak experience that we all had through the pandemic. I, I mean, that. talking about the Storm Chaser as kind of a reaction to, you know, what we were seeing in society at the time, it's really only one facet of the way the rest of the album kind of looked at every it's element easy, of that yeah. experience. Uh -huh. But in saying that, I think one place where, um, I guess like as a as a rock songwriter, let's say, mm -hmm. where, where it kind of differs is the idea of like composition versus lyrics, like music and lyrics. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time you'll see in um, in, in the rock world, the kind of construction of a whole musical piece which then have lyrics like fastened to it after the fact right. and we don't do that at all okay. in this band uh -huh. we, we tend to be a little bit more integrated in the way we approach stuff so once i get past the first couple of ideas i think off the top of my head the storm chaser was actually one where it, it may have actually been the last song we wrote for the record okay. i I'm not sure exactly. Again, it's a fairly, you know, yeah, yeah. fairly intense kind of um, process. But I remember uh, Dale, bassist of the band Dale Princey, and I were working on some of the kind of piano motifs that open uh -huh. the piece. Yeah, yeah. And it was one of, it, it was a rare example of something where as soon as that first idea came out, we had a, a pretty strong concept of the entire thing. Yeah. So it has that very Lydian vibe, that kind of sharp right. 11 throughout the whole yeah. song. And in the opening, um, I, I remember sending it to, to Jim, who is our vocalist, our chief lyricist. I tend to write most of the music, he writes most of the lyrics. We cross over occasionally, though. Um, and I think he had this concept in mind immediately of just how, uh, how much turmoil was in that intro. It sounds very dramatic, very over the top. It doesn't have a very clear sense of harmony, like it's very right, modal, right? right? And um, I, I think that led the lyrical direction, this idea of looking at the turmoil in society, as something that I could then become inspired by for the music. So we tend to have this very kind of give and take uh -huh. process. I'll write something, he'll kind of answer it and we'll see where that takes us. But I, I love to, when it comes to writing, I love to turn on the, I, I call it kind of the arrangement mind. You know, uh -huh. like once we've got a couple of motifs or a couple of ideas, from that point it's, it, 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 it's, it's almost like puzzle solving rather than just trying to throw creative things at the wall until right, they right, appear. Right. So and that's, that's, that was kind life. of one of the questions I had is, mm. do you have a consistent process you follow when composing? And that kind yeah. of answers my question. Because, for, for the most uh, part, yeah. I, I mean, for me, like, what it all comes down to is like a fundamental motif, like something that feels strong even just in the abstract. You know, like mm -hmm. maybe it's just a, a short melody uh, atop a short set of chords, some harmony, you right. know. And as soon as I've got something like that, which, like I said, I still to this day, even having done this as long as I have, and even being as analytical as I am, I still don't know where that first thing comes from. It just comes and cool, there it is, it's great. I like it and I start building. But at that point, I'm able to switch on, you know, music theory mind or intuition mind or whatever else and really dig into that world. But for what it's worth, I, um, in that process, very rarely use my guitar. And this is something that a lot of people find um, kind of surprising. I've had a lot of the, the VIP Q and A's we've done this uh -huh. tour. I've sort of you know discussed this, but I, I really like the idea of sort of audiating, like coming up with the melody in my mind and only later. And so that makes perfect it. sense to me as a classical musician. Of course, because, well, it's much more normal that way. Because we are so steeped in the traditions of, of music theory mm. and mm. and. Um, Solfege and, mm. and all the mm. oral skills that go with it, but exactly, so it's yeah. kind of exciting to meet someone from the rock side who, who thinks and and. Well, that's it. Way. Like yeah. what, what I find, and you know, in the early days, I'm sure there was a lot more kind of guitar leading the composition. But uh, what what I tended to find, and, and I'm sure this is echoed by many rock musicians, is especially guitar, a very physical instrument, as I'm sure mm -hmm. harpers as yeah. well, yeah. an instrument where things like shapes can kind of lead you if you're not careful. So the idea of just sitting back, you know, maybe there's a formative idea there and then I can just imagine where it goes. This is way more unbounded than this is. Exactly. So it tends to help me find things that, that are a bit more uh -huh. creative. But again, I, as I'm that's saying this, I realize it is a much more sort of classical <laughs> yeah, approach, I guess. So I was reading that you got your PhD mm. in music exploring the history of progressive, progressive, progressive rock. rock and its position as a progressive musical style. Mm. So how would you sum up, just in a few words, for me, having an idea of my background. Of course. Um, what what conclusions did you come to? Well, I, it, it's it's hard to sum up <laughs> briefly, I know, and I'm, course, my, my brain's I jumping a million places. But I, I think the the one thing I guess to to contextualize it is it comes somewhat out of uh, the discipline 
so formed around the sort of early 90s, which we call the new musicology, mm -hmm. which is the idea of like a kind of musicological study that's influenced by cultural studies and sociology and all of these other sort of um, uh, perspectives that you can look at the creation of music coming from. So, you know, a, a, a quick and dirty example would be analyzing a punk song. You wouldn't learn much from the notes. Right, you've got to look instead right. at the way these 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 musicians are dressing, or the scenes they work I in, see, or see. you know, uh -huh. the, like other elements. We call them like extra musical elements. So, uh -huh. with that as the context, I sort of wrote this within that particular analytical paradigm. But I, I'm much more prone to the notes. I'm much more interested in musicology, as it as it were. So I sort of built my study around. Um, a methodology which was trying to sort of find a kind of modernist spark in this music. Mm -hmm. So it comes from the observation that like if you look at, and you've just been studying this music too, uh -huh. the Beatles yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, you look at the kind of late 60s shift from um, the, the sort of popular music which was very like label centric, very kind of externally written through to especially the Beatles writing their own songs right. and then this incredible arms race of complexity that happened after. Yeah, right. So you know going from say like uh, Sgt Peppers in 67 to like In the Court of the Crimson King, you know the, the sort of formative progressive rock album and then all the way through the 70s like all of the you know the big progressive rock bands like Genesis and um, uh, Jethro Tull, the LP, uh, you see this incredible shift of uh, first, you know, we're going to be the artists ourselves. We're not going to be beholden to uh -huh. the commodified yeah, yeah, needs yeah, yeah, of the yeah. music industry. We're going to be the ones who are creating it ourselves. From that, uh, we're interested in classical music. We're interested in the avant-garde. We're interested in all this other stuff, and we're trying to pull it into rock. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated by that moment in time, and I realize how long this answer's already become. I apologize. No, no I love it. I, love I, it. I, was I was really interested in that moment in time where, where rock sort of, started looking towards this avant-garde. I uh -huh. compared it in my doctorate to this moment of kind of like rock modernism, like the same idea, right, everything right. has to progress, uh -huh. it has to uh -huh. develop okay. and build upon itself. But I was also really interested in the fact that progressive rock as a genre, which really didn't happen until quite a bit later, like it was one of those things that was sort of formed after the fact, um, didn't seem to maintain that impulse. Instead, it just seemed to sort of copy what had been done in the 70s. So that was a lot of what my doctorate was about, was kind of critiquing that element. Yeah. Sorry, not so, as brief as you would have liked. No, it's great. And you, you brought something up which, which I find fascinating, and, and it reflects what I find from the viewers on my channel. Because one of the games, I call it a game, but, but my approach to this music, um, when I sit down to listen to one of these pieces for the first time, no matter almost no matter what it is. Occasionally, he'll, he'll change the format. But most often, I will sit down with just the audio. Mm. No, no video, mm. no live performance, no nothing. So I am simply trying to hear the music. Mm, right. And assess and respond to the music. Mm. Which, of course, as you say, and as many people have, mm. have echoed, um, you've got to see them live to really appreciate their artistry. You've got to do, you, you, you need to understand this, you need to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why, especially, you mm -hmm. know, as you're saying, the, how they dress and, and all of that mm -hmm. is extra musical part of their, yeah. their... Yeah, some context for the rest yeah. of the, the, the stuff they're doing. But um, I'm always, my, my goal and my, my stated purpose is mm -hmm. to hear the music and to evaluate the music regardless of appearance stage presence anything sure. else and and so it's a bit of fascinating because i realized that in being so um focused of course i'm cutting out some of the other stuff mm. but at the same time it's fascinating to hear it just as well music. it's a project in its own right as isn't music. it and yeah. and what you're saying about um modernism and all of that it makes sense especially mm. well you know in the classical world, I don't know how familiar you are with 20th century classical yeah, movements, somewhat. but there's incredibly modernistic mm. movements there as well. And, and um, so it's sometimes I hear things and I think, oh, that, that reminds me of this, or, or I can relate that to this, mm. and it's, it's just fascinating. Well, here's a different question. What attracts you? Well, you said you grew up in this world, but what mm. attracts you to the rock and metal genres as opposed to other musical genres? I love that question because I actually do think there's something fairly, fairly unique um, as a as a composer, as someone trying to kind of create music that you know has has some sense of feeling that I can translate. And I think the the thing that attracts me to the heavier styles is exactly that. It's that 
in theory, we could sort of make our music as light as it needs to be, but we also have this wonderful like 10 out of 10 fortissimo kind of dynamic, which is produced largely by the timbres and things that we have access to. So that to me is what is so exciting about metal. I mean, there's also a, a, a visceral element to it. Like, I, you know, I've, I've gone through um, throughout my musical development many different phases, you know, dug into the jazz world or into you know, this or that. But um, metal is one of those things that uh, wh when it's harnessed as a heavy dynamic, I really don't think there's anything else that can do what it does. The closest would be an orchestra, like something where yeah, you have yeah. that level of intensity. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, like Wagnerian <laughs> horns and things like that. No, exactly or right. Some of the 20th century um, Russians or, or yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but see, that's it. That's what excites me about it. So, it, it, in one sense, it's kind of practical. It's like if I want this huge scope of dynamic range that I can exploit and play with, this sort of gives me that. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that. A lot of people probably wouldn't hear it that way, especially in the more metal-centric worlds, because the softer stuff that we do tends to put us at odds with some metal fans. I mean, we we because because we are ostensibly a metal band, we have been put on bills and like you know summer festivals in Europe or something like that. We we're playing with nothing but the heaviest bands, uh -huh. and we are not that. <laughs> so so that's sort of how I that's, you know, that's, that's what excites me about it. But it's it's yeah. definitely a, a, something that's a little bit more singular to the kind of progressive metal mm -hmm. subgenre, I suppose. So, have you ever composed any non-rock or non-metal music? I, I mean, I did a ton of different kind of exploratory songwriting. I've never really dug into the kind of um, the classical compositional okay, uh, practice. Yeah, yeah. So my, my conservatorium years were more in a popular music setting. Okay. So we still did a ton of oral stuff and all you know your classic kind of like conservatoire skills. Mm -hmm. But um, you know my composition practice would be more writing a doo-wop song or you yeah, know yeah. exploring some that other historical sense. style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so having studied the history and development of rock and being involved with progressive metal as you are, what do you see as for the future of the genre? Because you were just saying, you know, it was partly critiquing mm -hmm. how it's ended up. How do you see it moving forwards in the future? Yeah, it's tough. Like it, it, like I said, if you look at the history of progressive rock, it's amazing because it's this it, you you can you can you can pinpoint moments in time when outside ideas were being brought into rock, you know? Like uh, let's have an orchestra of rock for the first time or let's borrow some uh, in the case of like ELP, let's borrow some classical themes and things like that. But right now it feels like there's not a huge amount of music outside of rock that hasn't at least been borrowed or at least right, been looked right, into. Right. So I'm not super convinced that that's, that's where it goes next. I think a big part of it is probably going to be much more technological in nature. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen in uh, very much in the progressive metal domain is how much the DAW, like Digital Audio Workstation, uh -huh. you know, Pro Tools, Logic, yeah, yeah. all of those kind of things, how much that has influenced like the ability to write. So you can have more, you know, one man bands than you've ever been able to have in the past. I think that's something that's definitely um, caused the music to develop in different directions. You get a lot more kind of singular artistic visions, whereas in the past it was always very band driven. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's the answer, but the truth is I'm not really sure. And I, I also, this is going to sound really weird considering what my doctorate was about, but I haven't really thought about it much in the present. Like uh -huh. to me, I'm sort of more interested in the music feeling, you know, dramatic and emotive. And I haven't really concerned myself much with like, where could I go beyond this right, outside right. of my own intuitions? Well, it's, it's fine, you know. I mean, I, I don't really think about where could it go in the future either. Um, in, from my musical background, classical, I, I, my perspective is it's going to go where it wants to go. But at totally. the same time, it's a question that I find fascinating to ask. Mm. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah. Fascinating to think about as well. Yeah, exactly. So your bio says you lecture in music theory. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, as I said, that caught my eye about you is that this emphasis on music theory. Mm. That's something that I've not seen a lot of focus on in rock music. Mm. I mean, most bands, I see so many saying, oh, they don't even read music, mm. or mm. much less study music theory. It's mm. It kind of grew up in a more, uh, should we say, folk or, or non-academic yeah. setting. Yeah. Um, what do you think that music theory has to offer rock music? Yeah, well, I, you're exactly right. I think the history of rock has had a, a, a really, uh, at least a significant proportion of that and, kind and of like vernacular far, approach. There's another question to go with it. Do you think that rock music has suffered for lack of music theory? Or do you Ooh, think that okay. it's been one of its strengths? Let me see if I can weave those yeah, together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it is a little bit. So no, like historically, you're you're right. Like a, a good chunk of rock has been mm. vernacular. It's been people who are yeah. playing by ear and kind of learning as much in the band room yeah. as they are in you know, yeah. a music educational right. setting or something like that. And doing incredible stuff. Of course. And the the early days of progressive rock, I think, were some of the first times that you had like schooled musicians. Mm. Interestingly enough, a lot of those schooled musicians were. Uh, the pianists in the band or the keyboardists in the band. So, you know, think guys like Rick Wakeman is a really good example, or Keith Emerson, um, you know. Um, maybe you can dig into some of this progressive rock as, like right, a, right. A, as an approach <laughs> next time. Um, but interestingly enough, it's always been a pretty small subset and at different points in musical history it's become incredibly uncool so you know one thing that um one history that's often told is how in the late 70s punk kind of killed prog mm -hmm. um that, look that's I, i've problematized yeah. that a bit of my own I've, thesis I've and a lot of people have yeah. but the, the the takeaway is definitely that there was a push against overly schooled kind of bourgeois kind of music it was you know it was much more of a like uh um, kind of lower socioeconomic push against something that was perceived to be a little bit haughty and overblown at the time. And we've seen those same kind of waves happen multiple times throughout rock history. I think right now we're actually probably in something of a golden age for like people wanting to be a bit more schooled in music, at least around, um, at least around the kind of progressive metal and, 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 and you know, adjacent substyles. But what, what I find, to connect this back to the, the first uh, question, what I find the most interesting about theory is the ability to solve problems that otherwise you could just be banging your head up against for yeah. a long time. So, like I said, I, I find the first idea quite hard to generate, but once it's there, I can turn on, you know, analytical mind and sort of find different yeah. ways something could go, which can be driven a little bit more um, behind, like, uh, driven more by the intent of the piece rather than just wherever my hands take yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I you think know? of it as sort of a, an architectural... <laughs> tool set that's very yeah. much so very so, much so yeah yeah and, and maybe you know maybe that's the beneficial element of it but you know i would say at the same time like we're probably always going to have you know rock musicians who aren't schooled who are doing amazing things too sure. um, but i i can't do that i'm too neurotic about it <laughs> I, you know i, I want to be able to sort of understand yeah, everything yeah. You know? so uh do you see any just a quick answer do you see any mm. significant differences in the application of music theory within the rock genre as opposed to the classical, what we call the classical word? I, I would say yes, only in that we, we can be a little bit faster and looser with it. You know, yeah. it, it's not something where, um, where composition is sort of attached to form or attached to, you know, like very deliberate, um, say, say, compositional approaches or whatever yeah. else. Instead, for me, it can just be like, I, you know, I can draw on whatever I know. The more that I have available, the more options I have as I write. And that to me is yeah. probably, probably emblematic of, you know, how that's used for, 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 for most of us, say, more schooled rock musicians, right, right. I suppose. Okay. Great. Now, here's, here's a bit of a different one. What advice would you give to me, knowing that I'm a classically trained musician, um, in terms of how to relate to, to study, to approach, and attempt to understand what falls under the umbrella of rock music? I, I love it. I feel like there's this big like weight right now on me. Like, <laughs> no, 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 I, I think I'm, no. It's just it's like um, you know if if you ever have the interest and you don't have to, but if you ever have the interest to go to my channel and watch some of my early videos, you see me bringing all my classical skill set, and I have no skill set to to that is designed for this music, and and it's it's kind of a funny, humorous, and at the same time incredibly interesting dynamic. Definitely. I'm, I'm but, sure that was um, one of Vlad's big like, <laughs> like <laughs> interests in the early days. Yeah. And of course I learned as I go. But, um, you know, yeah. somebody from your side, what would you say? Of course. So, so two things come uh -huh. to mind. I think the first thing, and this is a, a, a slightly simpler thing, is I think if you're studying heavier music, like if you're studying stuff that is in that kind of trajectory of rock music, I think it's really important to pay almost as much attention to timbre and tone as it is to the notes, the rhythms, the harmony. Um, and again, it might seem kind of obvious, but like metal as an example, right. what differentiates metal from rock is almost exclusively timbral properties, right? Okay. Big clicky kick yeah. drums, really saturated guitars, okay. same instruments, but used in a kind of different okay. way. That's probably the easier one, but the, the, the slightly harder one and one that I think it's almost impossible to really form um, an appreciation for, I, I guess, the academic discourse on it. This is something that, that, mm -hmm. that has been studied pretty, pretty intensely over the last maybe three decades, is understanding the extra musical context that has, that, that has caused the music to form. So when you study progressive rock, for example, you can obviously look at you know, all of these kind of classical ideas they're borrowing from music outside of rock. 
But what's probably more interesting is looking at how it was a generational shift that caused that. You know, kids with a little bit more wealth, the kind of beginning right. of the baby yeah. boom and all that kind of stuff, who were going to art school and were able to explore these things that maybe their parents didn't have access to. Yeah. So, you know, it's like um, rock music, pop music, I guess, in general, is something that you can peel back many, many layers, and any one of those given layers could lead you in a totally different analytical okay. direction. Yeah. So, you know, you get some, like, new musicological studies which are looking at music videos, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's some of it seems kind of bizarre, but it's just yet another layer you could peel back. You know? uh -huh. Interesting. Okay, I'll have to keep that in mind. Um, just a quick question for a quick, sure. an quick answer. This one has been in my mind since I first listened to your band. And that is the name. Mm. Caligula's Horse. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Okay, I'm starting a band. I have a band. It's going to be my band. I need to name it. And I choose, of all things, Caligula's horse. Of all things. Of all things. <laughs> Um, what's the story behind it? Or, or well, how did that come about? So, so there's, I guess, a couple of things. Like, it, it was originally going to just be a solo project of mine when okay. I when I first started the band, and I, I think I'd originally called one of the instrumental pieces I was working on Caligula's Horse. I always loved the concept of um, the, this, like, clearly kind of problematic in a historical sense story, the story that probably never happened. I don't know how much you know about the kind of Caligula mythos, but yeah. the idea being that he made his horse a consul yeah, and a yeah, senator yeah, and all of this yeah. kind of stuff almost certainly never happened. Probably but it was, not. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I, it, think, <laughs> I think, in fact, I looked it up to, to, to freshen myself. And, yeah. Uh, he died probably before it was done, but. Yeah, that, uh, look, that, that, yeah, you, can, you can pick yeah. holes in it, but that's actually kind of the point. That's why I found it okay. really interesting. Uh -huh. So, like, the fact that it probably was, you know, at the very least overblown, um, at the very most probably just totally fictitious. Uh -huh. um, but there's also this sort of use of the term Caligula's horse in literature which implies like a phony which I always found kind of funny so you know we've got this progressive band we've got you know playing all these notes we're doing all this stuff and that's what the band name means so look honestly as I look at it now it's kind of a little bit more humorous than maybe some might take it but I you know I, I think it's it. cool and I, I like knowing the story behind it kind yeah, of adds some depth to it absolutely. okay last question because we're running out of time yeah, sure. um, if you were to sum up the message that you want to share with the world through your art what would that be? Um, above all else, I think we, we, we try and carry this message of hope around what we do. So, you know, you know, one thing that maybe differentiates us from a lot of other metal is that we don't tend to wallow in, in the dark or the mean-spirited. It's, it, it's like, it, it's an intense dynamic that we have access to, which, you know, therefore allows us to create a contrast and softer elements. Okay. Um, you know, think the kind of ebb and flow of, yeah. of, of okay. music is something we're really interested in. So we try and carry this idea that if we are going to explore a dark idea, it does have light to it. And our music is really caught up in the idea of, you know, we can be a metal band that still carries a message of love or a message of peace. Or I like, a that. Message I like of hope. that a lot. I like yeah, that. that's what we're that's about. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, for meeting with me. Um, I wish you a wonderful rest of the tour. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll cross paths again sometime in the future. Maybe. Maybe it'll be over in Europe somewhere. Maybe. Right? Wouldn't it be fabulous if there were a bit more time? It'd be even crazy to try to sit down and play something together, you know, harp, oh. and, harp and guitar or something. That'd be Any cool, day. That'd right? be incredible. <laughs> be fantastic. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank I you. I really enjoyed this. And Should we do this? It was great. Your hands are warmer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Go get some hand warmers. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> awesome. Right. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Before we forget, uh -huh. we would love to have to have this. It's a, it's a tour poster. Poster. What? And ah! a show of the band. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I don't know if you do t-shirts, but you know, should, at the very least, it can be a nice little piece. I should put this on. I should put this on. You'll fit, like, you'll fit right in. Like before I leave the house, I should put this on. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it, it matches your outfit. Like yeah, the colors, totally. at least. Right, the colors are great. Exactly. The colors are great. I can totally just yeah. switch, switch out the tops and they're just fine. Awesome. <laughs>